וערב טוב לכולם, ו... וזה באמת, זה כבוד גדול בשבילי להיות איתכם הערב. בקינדר טרנספורט זה משהו אינקרדיבלי ספיישל ואימפורטנט לבריטיש פיפול. ובטרוריבל סטורי של ההולוקורס, זה איזשהו נוט של משהו פוזיטיב ומדהים שקורה. And it's something that the British people still care about very deeply, and it still means a lot to people. So recently, the BBC had a program about uh, one group of the kinder transport children who were brought up in the Lake District in the north of England, which was hugely popular uh, and showed how much this still means to people. Uh, and every day, hundreds of thousands of people um, go past the statue celebrating the kinder transport children. at Liverpool Street Station in London, which is where many of them arrived uh, off the boat from, from France or from, the, from Holland, um, and is in the centre of London's financial district. And hundreds of thousands of people see that statue uh, every day. Um, and we plan in Britain to build a, a new National Holocaust Memorial and Education Centre, which we hope will be right next to our Houses of Parliament to show the importance of continuing to remember this. Uh, and I'm sure that the kinder transport will play uh, an important part in that. And groups in Britain, like the Holocaust Education Trust, uh, arrange for school children across the UK to, to listen to, direct to, to some of the kinder transport children, to hear their stories. Uh, because of course there's nothing, uh, a museum can be wonderful, but hearing the stories direct from somebody Uh, is, a, is an amazing experience. And of course, that's why we're all here tonight to hear, hear Henry's extraordinary story. Uh, and I had the privilege myself when Prince Charles, His Royal Highness, came to Israel in January this year to uh, attend the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. He really wanted, and we really wanted for him Uh, as well as the big formal events, as well as meeting people like President Rivlin, um, but also to understand the personal side. So he met not only a survivor of Auschwitz, but also George Sheffy, who is another kinder transport survivor, uh, who told us his extraordinary story. And I know that for Prince Charles and for me, it was really amazing to hear that, that story direct. Uh, and George even came into the embassy Uh, and for both the British and the, the Israeli staff at the embassy, hearing about his life, all the amazing things that he'd done, uh, and his memories, uh, was something really special for us. So uh, being able, able to have the opportunity to hear from uh, Henry tonight uh, is a huge privilege, and I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, of course, Henry has his own experience with the royal family, because when Prince William visited Israel two years ago, He also wanted to hear directly some of these stories, uh, and he had the privilege of hearing directly from Henry, uh, and that was uh, an amazing story for him to tell. So on behalf of the British government uh, and the British people, I would like to say thank you to Henry for everything he continues to do, uh, and to wish him uh, and the book uh, the best of luck, uh, and hope that tonight's event uh, is, is as meaningful to everybody Uh, as I'm sure it will be. Thank you all very much. Uh, good evening to everyone. It's an honor to be here. Thank you very much, Ambassador Wigging. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Fauna Henry and Judy, your wife, uh, for being with us uh, tonight and for your willingness to share with us your memories and your thoughts. Um, before we start, I want to, to congratulate you and wish you mazel tov because uh, You recently, in the last few days, celebrated your 88th birthday. So uh, we wish you all uh, health and happiness and much naches from your family. We gathered here today to mark um, Father's Day, and we saw that as an opportunity to talk about and to commemorate the memory of your father, Max Lichtwitz. And... Uh, And before we dive into the story of the kinder transport and his courageous um, choice, I would be happy if you could share with us a little about your father. Um, we see his picture here with you as a baby in 1932. Um, 
if you could tell us about your father, your family, where you came from. Well, uh, my father was a, a lawyer. He was one of uh, three brothers. Uh, he was the eldest, Max. The other two were Ludwig and Walter. The family business was a, a printing business. And the, the thing that always impresses me about the background is that uh, the Lischwitzes, the first Lischwitz that there was, uh, had been a German citizen for 200 years before his life came into power. We, uh, actually, he wasn't a German citizen, he was a Prussian citizen because there was no, no such thing as Germany. We have the papers of when the first Lischwitz, Lischwitz Moses Aaron, was granted citizenship of the Kingdom of Prussia. So, um, my family was a, a well-to-do family. Where did you live in Germany? We lived in Berlin, Kanzstrasse mm -hmm. 30. House is still there. Mm -hmm. Don't belong to, to the family anymore. But the family, the house was built by my paternal grandfather. Uh, and uh, no, yeah, my paternal grandfather on my grandmother's side. And uh, all the family, all the three brothers lived in the same house. So uh, I had lots of family around me when I was small. But of course, as soon as Hitler came into, into power, uh, my father lost his job. He could no longer work as a, a lawyer. And so he became a legal advisor to the Jewish Community Council. In other words, he was a lawyer, but he couldn't appear in the courts. He just did things for the Jewish community. And, and that was a position that enabled him to help Jews also during the war, after the war broke out. Uh, and before he helped, he helped people to escape. We, we know at least one person who he helped to escape on the eve of the outbreak of war. Um, the name was Hanschen Lewenstein. I'm still friends with a little boy who is no longer a little boy, of course, uh, till this day. And he helped her to get out. Um, but of course, he could not get out uh, himself. Uh, although once, when he was helping people out, he was on a he helped some people onto a ship, and the captain said to him, "Mr. Lischwitz, why don't you just go downstairs, and I'll forget about you." And he said, "Well, first I've got my old mother here, and secondly, where can I go without papers?" So. That's what I can tell you about my, my father. My mother died in 1937. So when I was a small child, I was brought up by my father, my grandmother, and by um, a nanny we had living in called Nupi. Thank you, Henry. Um, I want to uh, just uh, say a few words about the kinder transport so we have the historical background and then I'll be happy to hear more from you. Um, the story of the kinder transport, um, of the saving of about 10,000 uh, Jewish children uh, by sending them to live in England. Um, the story, uh, as we know, the situation of uh, the Jews in Germany became worse and worse uh, uh, since the Nazis uh, came to power. Uh, but the really dramatic turning point was Kristallnacht, November 1938, which was a massive attack and Jewish lives, about uh, 100 Jews were killed, about 30,000 uh, Jewish uh, men and women were sent to concentration camps. Uh, we know of synagogues being burned across uh, the country and uh, Jewish businesses being robbed and attacked. It was a massive attack. And uh, right after Kristallnacht, um, many, many Jewish families were frantic to save, at least save their children, at least find a way to get their children out of Germany. And after a huge diplomatic effort, um, uh, England agreed to open its gates to 10,000 10, uh, Jewish children, mostly from Germany, but also uh, from Austria and Czechoslovakia. And if I mention Czechoslovakia, we, we of course can, uh, it is connected to 
uh, Sir uh, Nicholas Winton, and who almost single-handedly um, uh, uh, ran the separation in Chewbacca. It was under 700 children from there and to send them to England. And um, uh, you arrived, uh, these children uh, arrived in England between December 1938 and up to September 1939 when the, bro when the war uh, broke out. And um, you arrived in England at the beginning of February 1939. Uh, can you tell us about that journey, what you remember? Can you tell us about uh, the separation from your family, from your father? Well, um... It's an odd story because, uh, unlike most children, I, I just cannot remember the separation from my family. My, uh, my guess is it's just too painful and it's wiped out. Uh, but it started when my father came to me, and uh, it must have been in late 1938, and uh, told me that I was going to go to England and that he hoped to, in, to join me. And he, he asked me, he told me the name of the people I was going to, and he asked me to pray for their welfare, which, which I did every night. And then, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sometime later, uh, he came and told me that the plans had changed, and I was no longer going to these people. I was going to some other people called Mr. and Mrs. Foner, and please would I shift my prayers from the previous people to the new people who were going to take me, which I did. And um, I, I just hope the other pe nice people can suffer from this. But uh, one day I found myself on a train with many, many other children in a, a compartment. It's a type of a carriage with a um, corridor on one side and compartments on the other. Uh, I knew nobody, and uh, eventually the, the train stopped, and the doors were flung open, and people in uniform, I imagine border guards, the SS, I don't know, came in screaming and shouting. And uh, we had one small suitcase each up on the rack above us, uh, and they, uh, they searched the suitcases and they did a body search on us to see we were not carrying any valuables. And I'm told that if girls had jewelry, they often, uh, the doors closed and uh, the train advanced a few hundred meters, I suppose, stopped again and the doors flung open and we were in another world because there were uh, ladies in white uniforms, uh, I think the Red Cross, this was in Holland, and they were dishing out hot dogs and drinks. And uh, I will say every child who is now in their 80s and who, who you, I talk to remembers those ladies giving out food and the changing atmosphere. Anyway, we carried on in the train to the Hook of Holland and we got on a, a ferry and the ferry took us to Harwich. I must say I can't remember the journey particularly well, but I do remember getting off the gangplank, the gangplank uh, in Harwich and going down and seeing a Bobby with his helmet, a British policeman. We were put in a train, we crossed the tracks, we went onto a train. He took us to Liverpool Street Station. And on the screen you can see that uh, we had labels uh, on us. We didn't have passports. There was a special law uh, covering these 10,000 children that Ella talked about. Um, and we were put in a big hall in Liverpool Street Station. And we sat there waiting. Uh, we, little group, in, in groups, most of the groups emptied out. We sat there waiting. Nobody understood anything. Nobody spoke English. Eventually, a lady came and collected us. Her name was Selina Levy from Swansea, town in Wales, and put us on the train at Paddington. And we traveled to out of England into Wales, to Swansea, and we were distributed to our host families. Must have been 20 or 30 of us, I suppose. Thank you.
Um, Henry, uh, I did mention that you were six and a half years old at the time. Right. You see your picture, a young boy. Um, and you reach, uh, you reach the, the, the home of uh, Winifred and Maurice Bonner in Swansea, England. Um, and already in the first days uh, that you arrived, you started to receive postcards from family members and especially your father. You see on the screen the very first postcard that you received from your father uh, from February 3rd, 1939. And he sent you um, painted colorful postcards to try to make you happy. Um, and I was uh, I think you, maybe you can tell us about these postcards or maybe a specific postcard that you remember. Well, well you're right. Um, these postcards came. Um, and of course, I, I, I read them at that time. I spoke German. But, but what happened was that um, uh, the strange thing that happened was my birthday. I came on the 3rd of February. This, this card was sent on the first day. Um, my birthday is on in June, June the 12th, and um, for that occasion, my father uh, telephoned me. And uh, I, I, when I, I talk to people about it, it's, it's difficult to believe how complicated it was to make an international telephone call in those days. But what happened was that some days before the exchange uh, uh, rang you up and uh, told you that at, say, three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, you should be by the phone because you're going to get a telephone call from Berlin. And that's what happened. And uh, that was for my birthday. Uh, and I picked up the telephone. It was the old fashioned sort of telephone where you have one in your ear and one on the desk. And a man spoke and it was my father, only he spoke in German and I could, n I could not understand him because in four months I forgot all my German. So uh, from that time on, uh, the postcards changed uh, language and were in English. And the Foner family, and I, I called them uncle and aunt, they kept those postcards and they put them in an album. And uh, when Judy and I got married, um, on several things they gave me, they gave me this collection of postcards from uh, my father, which I perhaps didn't appreciate the, the worth yes. of it really. Well, I, will, I will show this album in a moment. Um, we can see the first postcard is addressed to Heinz Lichtwitz, that's your German name. But as you said, uh, very soon you forgot completely your mother tongue, your, your German completely. And your father, as he, as he told us, uh, started to send you um, the postcards in English. And here we are. And there were already, I noticed, when he started to write in English, he addressed them to Henry Fauna, uh, to your new name, your adopted name. And what we see on the screen is the very last postcard um, sent on August 31st, 1939, uh, the eve of the war, day before the, the war broke out. And he's uh, and saying, I hope, I hope the war will not come, but if it does come, I wish you all the best to you and to your aunt, aunt and uncle. And uh, uh, as you said, it's uh, interesting to remark, and I wanted to ask about that. Um, we're talking about uh, um, Father's Day, and of course, commemorating your father and his very difficult choice. But of course, in your story, as you said, there is another father, there is another mother, uh, which of course are, as you said, you call, you call them aunt and uncle, but they were parents in every sense and they accepted you, accepted you into, into their home. And um, what is interesting is that these postcards were kept for you by Aunt Winnie in a special album. And um, I understand that they, what I'm asking is in a way they didn't want to erase your, your former identity, your original identity. They wanted to keep very nobly, I have to say. They wanted to keep your identity for you, your heritage for you. And I know that your father, in the few months before the war, was able to ship to England, to the Fauners, 
some of your property, some of your family property, even furniture from your home, and that the foreigners kept this furniture for you. Um, I can say that uh, where some of this furniture and also the, the postcard album is presented today in the Yad Vashem Museum in a special room uh, dedicated to the story of the kinder transport. But I was wondering, Henry, if you could tell us a story about that furniture that was waiting for you, that was sitting for you, and how the foreigners uh, decided to keep that for you. Well, th th this is one of the strange things that yeah, a six-year-old child is on a train and gets searched <clears throat> to see if he's counting valuables. A few months later, a huge lift, like a container for today comes, full of valuables, um, full of uh, stamps with swastikas on, so the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. But uh, what happened is that uh, uncle and auntie put these things into a storage called Pickfords in Swansea. Uh, Swansea was very badly bombed during the war and that uh, furniture repository was, um, was bombed and people had to take the furniture out. So what the phoners did was they got rid of their own furniture and put my furniture into their house. And when I, when I was growing up, I could never understand why the house was so damn full. The furniture was so big and the house was so small, you had to inch away around the furniture. It's only when many years later I went back to, to Berlin to see where I had been as a child, I realized that the flats were, were huge and that's where the furniture was. So when we got married, Judy and I, um, apart from all the things which are now in Yad Vashem, my mother's trousseau and so on, they offered us to give back the furniture. But of course, we didn't take it because uh, they'd had it for, I don't know, 20 years. It belonged years. to a different life, actually. Yes, yes. Also, we could never have put it into the house that we had there in the Yeshiva. Uh, so, well, but... Uh, the, you, you said something that they never tried to take away my identity and that, that the more I think about it, the more it's a marvelous thing on their part it's because they were a childless couple and they, they treated me as their own child. But they, they never tried to usurp the position of my father, always by my bed when I was a little boy were the pictures of my, my parents, they were always there. And they always said, Henry, you have a father, you have a grandmother, you have an uncle. After the war, we'd have to see what happens. So you were always sort of on hold. You were never formally adopted by them. You were always also still hind, still waiting to see. Yes, in, in, a, in a sense, yes. During the war, of course. But after the war, um, you decided to take their name. And you're Henry Foner today. Well, that happened during the war, actually, because uh, it, it wasn't uh, during the time of war with Germany. It wasn't a good idea to go around with a very Germanic sort of name and always having to explain, well, this is not really my son, this is not really. So they they just said, let's call you Henry Fonner instead of Heinz Rischwitz. And um, I've never changed either of them. So um, I've got two names. Interesting. Um, thank you. Um, some years after the war, you received through a relative your father's last letter. Um, I think uh, when you go through the book, um, I'll show it in the postcards to a little boy, where we showed all the postcards you received, and you, you hear your father's very, very loving voice uh, send you, sending all, to you always his love and, and missing you. And um, you had that all, all the years because of your Aunt Wendy. Um, but in a way, that was always the voice of a father speaking to a young child. And several years after the war, you received this letter. It is amazing how it even reached England because it was sent already in 1942. Um, it's not clear. It says on the top, uh, Spain interesting story how it made its way and in this letter your father is writing to a relative and a friend and he's saying goodbye and he's reasoning his choice he's explaining his choice to send you away and as i was going over the book 
I felt suddenly that in this letter, there's a different voice. You hear your father differently. You don't hear the father speaking to the young child. You hear the man. You hear an adult speaking to an adult, explaining his choice. And um, I know that receiving this letter was not easy for you. And uh, I'm hoping if you're willing to share with us your thoughts about, about this last letter. Well, th th this last letter came to me in a, in a strange way from uh, my father's second cousin, who he says was also his best friend, who managed to escape uh, Germany and get to America. And there was some small legacy in the family, and he needed my signature. And he, he said, by the way, I've got the last uh, letter from your father. Would you like it? And he sent me this letter. I said, yes, of course. And so he sent it to me. And um, it's- You were already, already a married man, you were- I was already a married man. And my, my late mother-in-law was staying with us and she spoke German and she translated it. Uh, and I have to say, after she translated it, I could not read that letter for about another 20 years. It, it, it shook the living daylights out of me. Uh, and for the, it's true what Ella says. It's it's a man explaining to another man why he let his child be go. Um, but the thing that really um, hurt me about this letter, I think, was that he he, he tells his cousin that how much he loved me and that he always loved me and so on. And I, I, thing I never doubted. And he asks this man to tell the phoners how grateful he is that they saved my life. And he didn't do it. And I, I really would have loved uncle and auntie to hear that voice of my father from the past, from the grave, thanking them for saving my life, which they did. And. Uh, I don't know, that, that's a letter which, if I talk about it too much, I'll get too uh, emotional. <laughs> so let's, of course, let's move of course. On. Um, so I bet this next picture is going to make you a lot happier. Um, you see here your family, your wife, Judy, your children and grandchildren. Uh, I know this picture is a little uh, not updated. Uh, you've already grown some more, your grandchildren. Uh, all very lovely. And um, um, I wanted to ask um, if we talked about that letter and we leave, leave it in the side, but as you lived your life, uh, you got married to Judy, you had an academic career, um, and you eventually uh, decided to make Aliyah and move to Israel. You had your children. Uh, during those years, those many years, did you, did you think about what you went through? Did you deal with these memories? Um, did it come at a later age when you became a grandfather? Perhaps you could share that with us. I think the answer to that is no. I mean, I, I knew it and everybody in the family knew the background, but it was not a large portion of my life. Um, I, and I think many other kinder transport children uh, know exactly what happened to people who were in Europe. And what happened to us was a relatively minor thing. Everything is relative in this uh, saga, of course. Uh, we were on the most part, for the most part, very lucky. I was particularly lucky. I got taken by a Jewish family. I got taken in by people who treated me as they would have treated their own child. Um, so I was very lucky. Um, and I didn't, um, this did not play a large part in our life. Uh, but uh, since through various lucky circumstances or various circumstances, I uh, formed the connection with Yad Vashem, it has become much more part of my life because uh, they took me as their sample of, uh, of their example of a gender transport child and they persuaded me that I should uh, talk about this to other people and 
I must say, I don't enjoy doing it, but I do feel that it's my duty. Thank you. To bear witness if I can. Henry, you told me about a good friend of yours that you knew from childhood in England and uh, that you even worked with for many years. And only at a much later age, you both realized that you were both kinder transport children. Can you tell me about that? Well, his name was uh, Tommy Berman. He came from uh, Scotland and I came from Wales. And for those of you who are not from the United Kingdom, that means we have very different accents. <laughs> Although we can both put on pretending to be English like I am now. Um, and uh, we met in Habodim, the Zionist youth movement, when we were perhaps 15, 16 years old. And then uh, we went our separate ways. We both ended up in Israel. We ended up in similar uh, positions. He was the head of the Kinetic Liminological Laboratory. I uh, was the head of the Geochemistry Division of the Geological Service. We worked together on various projects. And one day I, um, I went to a kinder transport affair in, uh, no, I went to a wedding, sorry, in Jerusalem. And we sat at the same table as Tommy Berman and his wife. And um, he said, uh, we started talking and he said, yeah, I happened to be in Jerusalem. So I came to the wedding because I went to the kinder transport. I said, what have you got to do with the kinder transport? He said, well, I was on it. And so was I. So we'd known each other probably 60 years and um, we'd never made this particular link. He, by the way, was one of uh, Sir Nicholas Winton's children. Mm -hmm. so um, he died. You know this? Yes. Okay. Um, we know this from many survivors that uh, uh, when they return to life and had families and uh, they put their energy into uh, living. Um, but I remember you mentioned something about becoming a grandfather, uh, how uh, not as a father, but as a grandfather, you started to think about your father's choice a bit more. Well, um, there are people who blame their parents for letting them go. Uh, and I was never one of these. But I, uh, I think what you're referring to is the fact that I, I never realized what my father went through until I was a grandfather. Because uh, we have a son called David. And he has a, a son called Asaf. And when Asaf was born, uh, David uh, called me up and he said to me, Abba, I can't imagine what your father must have gone through to let you go at that age. And that was uh, an amazing thing. Uh, that made me really realize it. And I think the other thing that made me realize it, when our eldest grandson was born, uh, Yuval, um, I started to think about these things. And the day I left, on the anniversary of the day when I left home, when he was exactly the age I left home, I took him out to the film and to have a, a, a something to eat. Um, and I never told him what this was about. It was more for me than for him, but it was a symbolic thing for me to think that my grandchild and I could go out on the day that you know, I left the family home. Thank you. Um, you told me once that for many years, and you said that, you started to say that before, for many years you didn't feel even that you had a story to tell because you were lucky, because you didn't go through uh, that terrible fate that the Jews that they were, were left behind. Um, and I was wondering uh, when you, um, you came to Yad Vashem, and um, the first one, I remember you told me that showed interest in these postcards, in these letters, in your story, and saying, telling you, yes, this is important, this is a story that has to be told, was Nomi Halperin, who was then deputy director of, uh, of uh, the director of the archive. And uh, I was wondering, um, going through that, uh, submitting 
giving uh, the material to Yad Vashem and also preparing the book, and publishing the book with the Yad Vashem publications, uh, how that uh, affected you, how that uh, changed your perspective about what you went through? Um, oh, that's a hard question. Uh, <laughs> Well, I don't think it's changed my 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 perspective. But, uh, the, the book has affected me. I mean, you know, uh, Yad Vashem did me the honor of letting me present that book to both the Prime Minister and yeah, Prince yes. William. Uh, that meant a lot to me. But you know, a six-year-old child comes to a country as a refugee. He grows up there. He served in the army there, the United anyway, and. Uh, 70 years later, a book is, a, is dedicated to his father, and he's able to present that to the people, the prime minister, and to the, one of the heirs apparent to the throne. It meant a lot to me, um, because I'm eternally grateful to Great Britain, um, because whatever historical uh, quarrels one may have with them, my life, they saved. As, mm -hmm. as did uh, Uncle Morris and Auntie Winnie. Yes. Um, but this recognition that you also, you're lucky, but you also lost. And uh, as you say, I'm happy that through this book, we are able to commemorate your father and your family and, and the difficult choice you made. Um, we're coming to a close, a close of this part of the, of the session. So uh, we'll have some questions from, uh, from the audience that's listening to us. And then before we go to the questions, uh, allow me, uh, Henry, um, to thank you again uh, for your generosity and, and your willingness to share with us uh, your memories and your thoughts. And I want to thank also uh, Judy, your wife, who I know is a huge part in everything you do. Hi, Judy. <laughs> thank you very much. And um, before we move to the question, to the questions, um, I would like also to thank again uh, Ambassador Wiegand for his opening remarks. It's an honor, thank you, sir. And to take this opportunity to uh, thank everyone who is with us tonight around the world, really around the world, everywhere, and to wish you uh, all, the, all of you to keep safe and healthy, and, and we should have our best wishes from Jerusalem. Um, this is only part of the story. Uh, there's so many more to tell, and through your questions, maybe we can share some more. Um, Katie? Yes, hi. Thank you so much, Henry, for sharing. Can you hear me, Henry? Yes. Wonderful. I have questions from the audience here. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the phoner's background? and how they came to Wales and why they decided to adopt a kinder transport child. Do you know? Well, I know some of it. Uh, the bottom line, why they decided to adopt a kinder transport child was that they, they thought that's what Jews should do. They did it without money. They did it without thinking of a reward. Uh, they b had both sides, both the Gordons, Winnie Gordon and Maurice Fona, both their families had a long history of looking after more unfortunate children from their families. And they just felt that that was the right thing to do. And, and they did it. I think it's the sort of, they were um, orthodox, they were conventional Jews, and I think that they, they typified the best of the Jewish tradition. And uh, I'm eternally grateful, obviously, for that. Um, she, Auntie had, was, I think, third generation in Wales, and Uncle came from Poland from a little shtetl called Simiatic when he was a young man, apprenticed to a um, to a watchmaker in a town called Pontypridd and had a shop where they had a, shop, a jewelry shop, a watchmaker shop and a jeweler's shop in Swansea. Thank you. Um, another person asked, 
Uh, what happened to your brothers? Were they saved? Uh, yes, both the two brothers, Lischwitz, were saved. Uh, it's a long story, but the young one read Mein Kampf in 19... Father's brothers. What? Father's my father's brothers, brothers yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, my two uncles. Um, they, um, the youngest read Mein Kampf and ran away to France. Uh, it wasn't far enough. Then they ran to Vichy, then he got caught, but they weren't sent to the concentration camps. They survived the war. And my uncle Ludwig was actually quite famous. He was a, he, he was a printer by profession. He worked for the German underground, not Jewish underground, German underground. He was married to a, uh, a non-Jewish woman who stuck by him through thick and thin. And he was a well-known forger. There's a book written, there's books written about the papers he forged for people who escaped, but it's a long story. But they survived the war, but neither of them had any children. Okay, thank you. Another person wanted to know, when did you make Aliyah? When did you come to Israel? 1968. Thank you. And lastly, Ella, um, I'm not sure if you have an answer, but one person okay. asked, uh, since Jewish children were sent from Germany to England, how did the English government not realize that the Jewish population was under a threat until much later? That's a big question. Um, uh, just to give a short answer, um, it has to do a lot with diplomatic efforts. Um, at one point, the situation was very uh, complex because um, Britain was also, of course, uh, held Palestine, um, but they offered to, uh, to bring into, into England 10,000 children, to save the children. And also we have to remember the difficulties because of the eve of the war, um, anything you could do, anything you could do uh, with the uh, Nazi government, uh, everything was difficult. So the least you could do, do it, whatever you can. So that's the short question for a big, bigger issue. Thank you. Um, Henry, do you talk to school children as part of Holocaust education? Yes, yes. In normal times when they let me go to Yad Vashem. <laughs> but we're all, we're all locked down. But uh, yes, I do. And, and not, only to, to, not only to school children, but also to many uh, adult groups. Uh, another question of how many, do we know how many kinder transport children are still living? Oh, I'm afraid I can't, I don't know, I don't know how to answer that. I, I can check. Uh, okay. I know that in recent years that there was a lot of organization um, um, calling these children together. Maybe Henry can tell about that and having meetings and about their shared, um, their shared experiences. Um, uh, by the way, in the book, in the book uh, um, published by Yad Vashem, um, I, I saw a question where we can get the book. We have an online store. You're welcome. We'll be happy. Uh, we uh, opened the book with a, a long historical uh, introduction that gives the whole story of the kinder transport and gives this perspective of Henry's story. So uh, that's a good place to also find information. More information. Oh, somebody I see is asking, um, oh, that's an interesting question. About, uh, what happened to my father? Um, uh, and the answer is that he worked for the Jewish Community Council. And at some late stage, when they, the Germans were rounding up the remnants of the Jews in Berlin, they made the members of the Community Council go with them to find the remaining Jews. Um, those had to report at a certain place at a certain time. And they were told that if they didn't come, that they would take members of the Jewish Community Council instead. Well, some of them, of course, didn't come quite rightly. So they took 20 hostages from the Jewish Community Council, and my father was one of them. And we now know that eight were shot, not my father. My father was sent uh, straight to us was sent to Auschwitz after a month and uh, gasped, more or less, as soon as he got there. Yes. Okay.
he was murdered in December 1942, and the last letter that I mentioned was several months before, um, and we bring his letter in the book, of course. Yeah. Somebody, somebody asked a question, what was it like to be in Wales during the war? <laughs> um, I, I can just say that, um, well, Swansea was very heavily bombed, so we spent a lot of time in bomb shelters and people were killed. But people in Wales accepted me very, very, very well. I, I have only the fondest memories of, of life in, in Swansea both the place and the people. In fact, one of my, probably my best friend died quite recently. We knew each other since we were six and we remained in contact, you know, with a, a Welshman. Thank you. Um, a few people would like to know, where and how did you meet Judy? I, I'm, met her on a train. I came to, to Israel on a six-week course for young professionals to see how, it, how they could learn, how they could possibly use their profession in Israel. I went to visit uh, my cousins in Karkur, my former cousins in Karkur, and uh, I missed the train from there. I worked in, uh, in Jerusalem, and I, it was, my cousin dropped me at Ramadan. He put, he put me on a train, and I sat in this train opposite a very good looking girl and uh, eventually uh, I managed to, uh, we managed to talk to each other and the, the thing developed from there and uh, she, uh, she, she uh, said that she was a, a tourist guide at the university so I said will you please guide me well, I'm still waiting for the guided tour, but uh, we got married instead. So that's a short story. And Best you that ever happened to me in my life. And you celebrated your 60th wedding anniversary recently. Yes, too much. You were alone at home during the COVID. Yes, yes, on, on Zoom. <laughs> we have another couple of questions asking if um, if you could speak a little bit more about your mother, if you know. Well, my mother uh, committed suicide when I was five, five years old. Um, as so many Jews did at that time. The exact circumstances, I don't know, because it was kept hidden from me until I was grown up. In fact, Judy knew, I was told she died of pneumonia, but my aunt from Paris, Walter's wife, told her otherwise. And um, so that's the sad story. She just presumably couldn't take the discrimination anymore. Um, another question that we received was, did you attend the 1989 reunion organized by Bertha Leverton in London or another kinder transport reunion? No, I didn't. Um, the real reason is that I went to a, a, a small Jewish community to a family. So I really didn't know uh, very many uh, other kinder transport children. In fact, until I met Tommy Berman, the only person I knew was somebody called Naftali Weinberger, who also came to Israel and who also was some time with the Fona family in Swansea. So that was the only person I knew. So I never really felt a strong bond with the other kinder transport people. You did go to some later. Well, we went to some meetings here in, in uh, Israel. Can you tell us about that experience, meeting other uh, adults who were children on the kinder transports? Nothing much to tell, really. I think we just tell each other the story and reflect on how lucky we were to come through this. Although, of course, most of us lost our families, but not all of us. Yes. Um, we have a couple questions relating to uh, 
your German roots, have you ever taken your grandchildren back to Berlin? And have you ever had the desire to speak German, um, your mother tongue from birth? Well, I wish I could speak German, uh, but I can't. And it's even more uh, emphasized when I studied chemistry, you had to know German. So I had to go and try to relearn enough German to understand scientific papers, which, well, I passed the exam, but that's, that's all you can say about it. And what was the other question? Ah, have you I did not take, German? no, but I did take my children because um, we put, there are these things called Stolpersteiner, the little brass commemorative stones, which are put outside houses, not only in Germany, but mainly in Germany, where people lived. It's a, a project was... of an artist um, in, in Germany. And when we put those eight stones outside the house where we all lived, uh, then we, I took, I and my, our three, Judy and I and our three children went. And a few of the grandchildren who at that time lived in Holland. One of those Stolpersteiner, by the way, is paid for by a very nice lady from Germany who read the book and wrote the Yad Vashem and asked if she could write to me and she wanted to put a name. She wanted to honor my father, she and the mother, by paying for one of those stones. And we've, her name is Juliana von der Wenzer and we've become firm friends. And I think that was a, a really noble thing for somebody to do. Yes. So I'll mention, Katie, that the book was also published in German and in Hebrew. So it could reach a wider crowd, wider audience. Yes, I put a link to the online store and I'll put it again at the end of our discussion. I'll put another link for anyone who's interested in uh, purchasing the book from our online store. So I think we will conclude this uh, very, very moving and interesting evening. You know, when they say in the Talmud that that who says one life, it's as if he says an entire world. I always talk about it when we show Henry's uh, book and this picture that you and I showed uh, at the end of your presentation of the entire family. Uh, it's not only Henry that they saved, that was saved this whole uh, organization, but, uh, and, and the founders, what they did, but everything that came afterwards. And all of us that are so lucky to hear him and also all the chemistry that he taught and I researched all this year. So it's much, much more than just saving, it's not just, but saving one person, it's an entire world. Thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Ella. And um, again, I want to thank the ambassador for being here with us and uh, giving uh, this very meaningful introduction. Have a good day, have a good night. And we hope to see you again. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody.